there is something I, I used the term earthquake weather before. Do you, do you, we talked about that? Yeah. Where yep. it's just it's there's something weird in the air, right? That it's just a little too still. There's no breeze. There are no clouds. Like it feels like there's something ominous. Just like you're sitting there right before kickoff, and just like I don't know. I don't feel good. Like yeah. uh, the offense hasn't been clicking. This team always just has something for us that is unexpected. Yeah. I don't know. Something's off. Something's weird. And so that to me is a, is a hallmark of your Purdue's, your Arkansas's, your Syracuse's, your Oregon State's, Kansas State's, your Tulsa's. Like there are teams that just embody that for a number of teams. And I looked up like the the Winspedia. Is that what you use, right? Winspedia. Winspedia so, to to yeah. see the head to head matchup history. And we asked this of people on, as you mentioned, you know, wherever they congregate, Twitter, Instagram, what have you. A lot of great answers here. I I actually think we have a number one situation, and we can get into it first or at some point. I think the number one situation is Ohio State and Purdue. Yeah, Purdue. Purdue for Ohio State. Interestingly, a lot of Big Ten fans also said Purdue. Yeah. We had Iowa and, people saying Purdue. Uh, we had Minnesota people saying that their matchup with Purdue is weird, too. So Purdue, Purdue has found itself into some odd crevasses in the world of <laughs> college football, to say the very least. Um, Do you find you find yourself in odd crevasses, Ty? Is that somewhere you find yourself in life? Not generally. Okay. It has happened before. Uh-oh. Let's unpack Purdue. Okay. Let, let's unpack Purdue. So Ohio State fans definitely threw out Purdue. We know that there's a little bit of an odd history there. Purdue, interestingly enough, was in the throes of being the ultimate giant killer in the 2021 season. Then they squared off against Ohio State and got drilled. Yeah. <laughs> that was that you'll, you'll recall that was kind of at the height of Purdue knock you off number two teams or whatever. And, uh, got to that matchup with Ohio State and I don't think you or I were really buying Purdue as being able to pull that caliber of an upset at that juncture in the season but uh Purdue definitely knows how to make things weird. Yeah, they've won three or four times this century um against Ohio State. They've needed Ohio State has needed a Kenny Guyton sort of miracle comeback to beat Purdue one year. Terrell Pryor had a four turnover monstrosity of a 2009 <laughs> game, I want to say. Couple fumbles, oh couple gosh. picks. That was brutal. Talking, you know, the Purdue guys who have, you know, Keith Smith and Ralph Bolden and Caleb Turbush like for whatever reason and the the weird thing about Purdue as well is between the end of Joe Tiller and this Jeff Brom era was kind of a disaster of coaching. It was you know, Danny oh, yeah. Hope and Daryl Hazel. It took an Ohio State guy to really bury Purdue and Daryl Hazel. Um, but yeah, Purdue is nowhere near Ohio State's rival. You know, whether you want to say it's to a certain degree, you know, D'Antonio, Michigan State, obviously Michigan, Penn State, you know, the, the whiteout situations. But Purdue... It always looms large for Ohio State fans, especially ones who have built up that scar tissue. And, of course, we had the, the Rondell Moore game a couple of years ago that really emphasized that this is a very real situation for Buckeye fans, no matter how good the recruiting classes are, no matter how Heisman-worthy their quarterbacks are, or playoff-worthy the squad is, Purdue's always lurking. Do you have one for Penn State where you're just like, Penn State's Iowa. I yeah. I mean, let's, let's be honest about this. Um for me, the origin of this was the game on October 23rd, 2004, the infamous 6-4 game. I was there. <laughs> I was in the student section. I had graduated in May and had a couple buddies who were still on their, I don't know, second tour of duty, I guess, at that point at Penn State, super seniors. So I was staying with them. We got student tickets. And all I remember thinking is that this is like watching a demolition derby where it was never really a matter of, oh, who's going to win? It's who is going to do the least to, um, to, to like hurt their chances. The most. like, right. It was such a bad experience watching that game from the stands. Penn state's offense was so bad. This is a Zach Mills era. Penn state. <laughs> How offense. bad was it? <laughs> Penn state's <laughs> offense was so bad that Iowa was up 6-2 to two with about 2 minutes and 13 seconds left. They took a safety out the back of their own end zone rather than punt it and give uh, give Penn State the ball. 
at like the 45 <laughs> yard line because they knew there was no chance Penn State was going to move against their defense and they didn't. Just a terrible game. There were five turnovers for Penn State in that game, seven in total. Offenses were so bad, 315 yards of total offense combined. So just an all time punt fest. You would have been playing Dvorak. We'd have been talking it through on this show and, and poking fun at it, even though this was, I guess, a couple years prior to our show. But um, Iowa right now currently on a two-game winning streak. They did win the game this past season. You'll recall that was the one where Sean Clifford got hurt. Iowa came back. They won 23-20. This is ever the game for Penn State. Ever since, for me, that 2004 game, Whenever I was on the schedule, doesn't matter what the point spread is, doesn't matter who the quarterbacks are, doesn't matter where the game's being played, that is always a game that just scares the ever-loving crap out of me. Got to throw the records out. You have to. Got to throw, gotta throw to. them out. Yeah. Iowa. And and I saw other people throw out Iowa as well. You know, I noticed that there were a lot of Big Ten fans throwing out teams kind of in like, in the Iowa vein where it's like, they're always just very sneaky good. Sure. Or not so sneaky good. Just full on good. But even yeah. the wins, like the, what year was it when Trace McSorley hit somebody in the back of the end zone to win that game? I don't think you would find a lot of diehard Penn State fans leaving that experience happy. Just relieved it's over. Yeah. Just, oh my God, okay, fine, it's a win. I need to stop thinking about that. I need to stop living inside of the energy of this game. And that was, was that also the Saquon game, the hurdle game? I, I don't recall. I it don't, may have been. Well, that was, was yeah. that on the road in Iowa? The game winning throw I was. So. I believe so. And I think the yeah. Saquon was as well. I, all I know is all of these Iowa games feel like a war of attrition. Yeah. And you're just happy to get out of it. You're just happy to get out of it. You don't care how you how you win, what the score is, if you win. But just getting out of that game without a freak injury or without a, a soul crushing loss or mm-hmm. just a soul crushing performance, it it just feels like it's really difficult for Penn State. That six four game, I think, is akin to people saying, Well, it's pizza. There's no such thing as a bad pizza. Oh, it's sex. Was, There's no such thing as bad pizza. sex. That was bad pizza. That was bad everything. You that can, game if you can say it's still college football, but there is such a thing. Now, I, I can appreciate comical type cheese it bowl situations in which we're getting crazy turnovers. The offense, like it's a bowl game. It doesn't have the same baggage. I get appreciating things that are so comically weird. It's snow game, a monsoon game. When you were watching your team, like I think that actually might be the answer. It might not be the opponent. It's the game in which your offense was run by some combination of an inept offensive line, inept quarterback, inept uh, offensive coordinator. Big time. Where coordinator, yeah. a three-hour football game takes 17 and a half <laughs> in your mind. My team specifically, the Oregon Ducks, it's so very clear. I mentioned, I alluded to the, the Stanford tight ends. So Stanford keeps Oregon out of the national championship both in 2001 and 2012. The 2001 team was not especially good. 2012 was a, a good, not great. Stanford probably peaked in about 2010. Uh, Stanford team. Um, so th- there's that. There's this past year where Stanford was god awful, and Oregon managed to lose that game. Granted, Joe Moorhead had an emergency surgery and was not able to coach in that game. But that was a rough, rough loss. Stanford's just always hanging around there, ready to spoil things for Oregon. And then the Arizona Wildcats. The Arizona Wildcats. The desert is haunted for whatever reason for Oregon, especially going to Arizona. So in 2000, I want to say six, Chris Henry looked like a random Heisman running back and ran for like 200 yards in Eugene uh, for a a pretty bad Oregon team. That was a Brady Leaf, early Dennis Dixon, flip-flopping Oregon team. But Arizona through the years, House of Horrors, Kellen Clemens shatters his ankle in the desert. Dennis Dixon had already torn his ACL, but emphatically tore his ACL against Arizona in the desert. Um, I want to say BJ Denker completely tore apart a Mark Helfrich team in 2013. That's the sort of skinny lefty who's probably leading a life doing something not related to sports at this point. But there are random Arizona games that 
no matter where I am, no matter what I'm thinking about with Oregon, like I don't, I am never taking. Oregon has blown out Arizona in games. They shut out a Rich Rod team. They demolished an, an Arizona team in the Pac-12 championship. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Arizona is always lurking, and I hate it. I hate the cats. I hate the, I hate Willie Tuatama. I hate Nick <laughs> Grigsby. I hate all of these guys. Khalil, what was his name? The the uh, Kadeem Carey. Tate. Well, Khalil Tate. Kadeem, they actually Oregon did well against Khalil Tate, but Kadeem Carey. All of these guys. J.J. Taylor. I hate seeing Oregon on the field with Arizona. It brings up I've too got, much. I, I've got in front of me the box score from the 2018 game. Okay. Where Arizona won 44 to 15. That was ter- that was Mario's first year, I think. It was Mario's first year. Yeah. Um. It was Justin Herbert, right? Justin uh-huh. Herbert had had an okay day. He led the team in rushing with 31 yards. Oh. Oregon couldn't get anything going on the ground. Khalil Tate. Three touchdowns. He was sensational. Yeah, they, they did he do was, well against Oregon, yeah. And that was a J.J. Taylor game, too, where he went over 200, had two scores. Just not a good look in that game for the Oregon Ducks. Yeah, I remember that one pretty vividly. We talk about, you know, Pullman or Lubbock, you know, things that are sort of far removed from, not society, but far removed from bigger places. And Tucson's, what, a couple hours from Phoenix. But you go to Tucson, you play a night game. I don't know. You can talk to USC fans. You can talk to UCLA fans. I think UCLA had at some point like a crazy charm season and Arizona blew the doors off of them in Tucson. They're just ready. They're always there's a hunger to Arizona in the desert at night that I hate but respect so thoroughly. But that is baby. That is. I mean. It's that scar (laughs) tissue. It's that scar tissue that I wish you saw. I hate it. Yeah. I hate it. I hate it. And I'm let's let's go other places because I can't talk about this any longer. 